Oh, for God's sake, we all knew it was going to be shit. We open on a text crawl, uh, text PowerPoint presentation? No, I, I don't know, guys, leave me alone. It is a lawless time. Which, when you consider the Empire are basically in every major scene in this film, I'm not sure lawless means what the film thinks it means. Crime syndicates compete for resources, food, medicine, and hyperfuel. Yes, they're going to double down on the fuel fiasco in The Last Jedi. They won't last long burning fuel like this. It's just a matter of time. Oh, shut up. You used fuel to create a chase that made no sense to the entirety of the plot. Ranger Solo over here is only using it as a rare resource that drives the entire plot. Uh, for fuck's sake. On the shipbuilding planet of Corellia, the foul Lady Proxima forces runaways into a life of crime in exchange for shelter and protection. Hey guys, remember this? I thought run Imperial starships. Not the local bulk cruisers, mind you. I'm talking about the big Carillion ships now. Yeah, that one line, they made it into a whole movie. Remind you of anything? You weren't on any mercy mission this time. Several transmissions were beamed to the ship by rebel spies. <laughs> I rebel. Liar! The film opens with a high-speed chase as Ranger Solo is evading some randoms. He puts his signature dice in the center of his windscreen and nobody cares because it wasn't the OT that said those dice were special, it was this abortion. Go away! Ranger then gets to the Blue World where he meets Daenerys Targaryen, who is his girlfriend, I guess. They both scavenge for Lady Proxima and live in her shelter as a result. But everything is going to change now because Ranger has pocketed some fuel and they can sell it to get off Corellia. Sadly, they are captured and searched. He very cleverly passes the fuel off to his partner first, and so they don't find it on him. But for some reason, they don't search her? She's right next to him. They date each other, to the boss's knowledge. And you could literally see the fuel in her hand, but ah, fuck it, the centipedes have bad vision or something. We then go and visit what seems to be one of the bigger reasons this movie costs so much money. It's a giant, physical, water worm peed vampire thing. This is Lady Proxima, and she's in the film for about 40 seconds. Why? To then prevent his own death, Ranger Solo pulls out a thermal detonator. Remember when we did that before? Wasn't that great? We're doing it again. Though Centipede Vampire points out that it's just a rock. And Ranger is like, it's not a rock. And then the center thing is like, yes, it is a rock. And the audience wonders whether there was a funeral for comedy before this film began. He then breaks a window with the rock, letting light in, and the centipede, being a vampire, reacts like it just saw Rose Tico. That's how we're gonna win. Not fighting what we hate. Saving what we love. Why in the hell is your main vampire holdout room protected by thin glass from direct sunlight? How fucking stupid. And so they escape. They go into an Empire checkpoint and try to leave Corellia. Ranger hands his dream girl his dice. No, not that one. The dice are important. They are given meaning here so that you appreciate this mess a little more, okay? Anyway, down to just some hard luck, Daenerys is kidnapped and Ranger has to run, leaving her behind. Don't worry, she'll probably come back. The trailers show her a lot sadly. The Empire send out an alert for the entire area for an escapee, and he bangs on the window telling Daenerys he will find her, which somehow doesn't get him caught? There are outposts everywhere, and somehow he's just slipping past security by sitting next to a wall despite being the most obvious target in history. Eh, fuck it, we're having fun. Ranger Solo then opts to join up with the Empire to avoid being captured, and requests a chance to be a pilot, which doesn't happen, but something, something else happens. The guy at the checkpoint is like, what's your name, sir? And Ranger Solo is like, oh, it's Han. But the guy wants his full name and Han doesn't have one, apparently. Han has nothing. He even clunkily says, I have no people. And so the guy says, ah, well, your name shall be Han... Solo. You heard it right, folks. Han's name comes from some random officer deciding it sounded neat. We didn't even need an origin scene for his fucking name. And that's what they did with that. Wonderful. So we skip three fucking years, because that's how long Ranger Solo was apparently with the Empire. You would think three years in an Empire environment would change a man, but nope. It's so uneventful, they don't even mention it really, aside from what we see now, which, yeah, that's not very impactful, right? That wouldn't change a man. Then, on the horizon, he spots a man, shooting a blaster and then flipping it over and over again in the most self-masturbatory sequence from the film. He shoots, then flips, then shoots, then flips, for no fucking reason. 
reason reminds me of Stallone sucking his own dick in Expendables. So it turns out the pistol dude is Woody Harrelson, and he's getting extremely frustrated because Ranger Solo starts following him around everywhere and asking about his Rampart AMA. It turns out Rampart isn't with the Empire, and he's here to steal an Empire ship for a job he's apparently got to do because he's an outlaw or whatever. So he reports Ranger Solo as a mutineer and gets him thrown in prison. Could have accepted him on his own team, but apparently he's kind of against that for reasons. So Han gets rather frightened, having no idea what the beast is, but being taken to it. It turns out to be Chewbacca, which of course, why not? Chewie has apparently been carried around by the Empire this whole time as a team mascot without Ranger Solo knowing, despite being with them for three years. Chewie is essentially their human body disposal unit. The guy has been eating people to stay alive this whole time, potentially years, and he tries to eat Ranger Solo, but he's never in real danger since, you know, these are a thing. Chewie even throws him around, pretty much shattering his spine about four times, but it doesn't matter because Solo has thick plot armor. There is an attempt to reason with Chewie several times, but it doesn't matter because he is hell-bent on getting food, I suppose, but then he speaks Wookiee to Chewie, and that works? Film, you do realize that Chewie understands English, right? So the whole pleading for his life thing shouldn't work because he's already tried it in a language that Chewie understands. Also, I find it amusing that you're an origin film, but you couldn't be fucked to explain how Han Solo can speak Wookiee in the first place. He is a random outlaw from Corellia, and he just happens to know a language that'll actually save his life and strengthen the core of these two, and he just, he just knows it. That's, that's what they did with that. Wonderful. So they escape by destroying this pit they are trapped in. They jump out, and wouldn't you know it, they see the ship that Rampart wants fly right over their heads. And so they follow it, taking them right to Rampart as he's leaving, and they come along and he just accepts them. <sighs> I'm sorry, but what the fuck? Let's rewind a bit. Why is it that two idiot stormtroopers are stood on the only part of the grating that consistently wobbles every time they hit the pillar? They just allow themselves to be dropped. And why is it that they are just dead and gone from falling the same two meters that Ranger Solo was just thrown through? Lucky it doesn't have the same effect on him, huh? So we can actually escape now. Why is it that five seconds ago there was a massive army's worth of troopers in this base that have now disappeared the moment that Chewie and Solo are escaping? Why is it that the Empire have no system in place to detect unauthorized exits by their own ships? Did they seriously have no idea that Rampart stole this shit? Why would Rampart now risk his stolen ship to land it and pick up the guy he just sent to prison on a whim? That's a lucky change of heart for our heroes, isn't it? What stops him from betraying you? Why would you want to hire the guy you just did that to? Bloody hell, welcome back to Disney Star Wars, people. My brain is already rotten. Which is fitting since we are then treated to a showering scene where Han and Chewie get wet and stay about one inch away from each other. Why? Why was that your vision for Star Wars? Why did you look at Star Wars and say, you know what would bring this together? You know what's missing from these two guys? A scene where they shower together. Thank you for bringing us that important event. So we then get the scene of Chewbacca sharing his name and they say this. <laughs> You're gonna need a nickname, because I ain't saying that every time. So they cleared up the origin of Chewie's nickname. Turns out it was a nickname. That's what you did with that. Wonderful. Anyway, Rampart's team is made up of himself, a monkey, and Maeve. Maeve begins a scene complaining that they should have hired the Zan sisters or Bosk to help them with this job. It's recorded with ADR because they have a panning landscape shot when she says it, meaning that they likely went back to add these references to the Star Wars universe when this film was in its first cut. And it's so painful to listen to the shoehorn connections throughout this movie that I want to restrict the access the writers have to Wikipedia. During the scene, we also get a barrage of lines telling us that Maeve and Rampart love each other leading to them having a big snog, meaning that she is going to die in the next scene and you should care. And then Chewie puts on his iconic ammo belt because it was on the floor, I think. That, that's what they did with that. Wonderful. Then Rampart takes the stock and the forearm out of a rifle, attaches the front sight to the rear sight and throws it at Ranger Solo. So he has his gun now. Yes, Han Solo's legendary modified Mauser is chucked at him from some guy who made it from a random rifle he didn't care about. That's what they did with that. <sighs> Wonderful. They're really taking advantage of the elements of this character that make him iconic. We then begin the train heist, and I'm gonna run through this whole scene first because my lord, what a mess. The plan is that Ranger Solo, Rampart, and Chewie are going to decouple the section of the train they need to steal. Maeve is going to blow up the tracks to enable the train to be free of the track, and Monkey Dude will carry it away after it's connected to his ship. Um, the whole idea that the Empire has to move stuff on a train is <laughs> a lot of 
They have these things called spaceships. <laughs> Members of the Empire start attacking, while members of the Marauders, who are this previously unmentioned faction who like to steal from thieves, start attacking, while a series of probe droids start attacking. Remember this guy? Well, there's like seven of him now, and they're all built to defend a train? Aren't, aren't they probe droids? Did you actually read Wikipedia, or did you just grab the titles? Anyway, Maeve gets shot by the droids and loses her gun, so she decides to blow up the train tracks with her on them and dies for it. She was in the film for about 40 seconds. Why? Then the Marauders get onto the Monkey Man's ship and kill him. He was in the film for about 40 seconds. Also why? Our remaining heroes manage to just make it out alive with a brief moment for the film to bait Chewie's death, which is utterly bizarre. It's You, you guys realise he's, he's alive for another, like, 40 years, right? Are you hoping that people have tried to forget the OT now? Because you're gonna have to try a lot harder than just The Last Jedi to kill those movies. It's time to let old things die. Fuck off, Kylo. You aren't gonna convince us to be in any kind of tension-filled moments when Chewbacca's life is threatened because he can't die, but hell, you do it with Ranger Solo, like, five separate times in this movie, so it's not like you're gonna listen to me. I mean, in this scene alone, the Empire Troopers are given this huge chance to shoot Ranger Solo, and they just don't. It's like the movie is embarrassed to put him in these adventures because he has to be in danger, but he also can't die, so it's just awkward mainly. I mean, at least they kill people we've never met before, that's always the best way to go when you're in that situation. The remaining heroes make it out alive, but only at the cost of leaving the payload to drop, escaping the marauders and burying their dead. So, um, about that scene, let me just slow it down and go through some of the more nuanced elements. Why in the first place did Rampart and Maeve say they didn't want to hire anyone extra when they never could have completed this task without the luck of finding Ranger Solo and Chewie? They are the reason the train had any chance at being decoupled. This whole thing was invented as a quirk from Rampart so we could have the prison scene bolting Chewie onto the story. That's just silly. Why did the writers choose a probe droid to be the established defense mechanism for this train? Why wouldn't they make a new droid here? Are you that desperate for a reference? That's just silly. Why did Maeve kill herself? She could have gone back down the platform she was on. She could have jumped to the rail and ran to the other side. She could have tried anything. But she gave up because there were two droids trying to shoot at her who constantly missed the hell out of most shots. That's just silly. Speaking of the droids, what the hell were they doing? Maeve is hiding behind what is essentially a stick of metal and they both stay on the other side. A computer's not smart enough to figure out how to fly around a pole. That's just fucking silly. Who the hell are the marauders? Why did didn't anyone mention these people before? They came out of nowhere and literally ruined everything. They've cost every faction in this whole environment a bunch of lives and accomplished nothing. That is quite beyond silly. I really hope those marauders don't turn out to be the good guys, because that would be embarrassing considering this scene, wouldn't it? Speaking of which, during the scene, the monkey says this won't be the greatest day of his life because he's been to a Minoc roast and they're the best. Remember Minox? <laughs> Minox. Yeah, we're really digging here, but as long as the audience keep Google open, they might still be able to watch the film. Not to mention the fun moment of Ranger Solo just driving the ship forwards since the monkey was dying, and for that, he says, You know, you are one hell of a pilot. Which is interesting, by the way. Why is Ranger Solo such a good pilot? Why is it that he's such a good shot with a blaster? I'm sure these questions will be answered in time. So then Ranger Solo gets punched by Rampart because he let the payload go to save their lives. He has this strange self-righteous speech about how he should never have let it go because they owe it to Crimson Dawn, which are essentially the criminal syndicate in these parts named by a child of the Xbox 360 gamertag era. But Rampart is angry with Ranger Solo for not knowing this information when he never told him about it in the first place. Owing a gangster is better than being dead. Surely. It's supposed to act as some reveal to the audience, but we're just sitting here not understanding what the fuck is even happening. Now we have the evil Empire, the evil Marauders, and the evil Crimson Cringe, and they're all coming for our heroes, and Ranger wants to do a job for one of these factions so he can get enough money to get a ship to go back and pick up his girlfriend. He's just sure she's alive, and that this is the way to go about getting there, and that she's still there and willing or able to even leave? Also, he just, for some reason, up and left the Empire today instead of 
any time during that three years of soldiering, but fuck it. Too much thinking, everyone. Too much thinking. Turn your brains off. How fucking dare you? I am so shaken for what's to come. The drama is reaching insane levels. Ranger and Chewie can't actually be killed, so I wonder if we're going to get some new characters so that we can kill them too in heartfelt moments. Anyway, he actually asks, how are we going to find the Crimson Cringe? And Rampart says, that won't be a problem. And then the ship just floats by them. He's just here, apparently. He's, he said he hangs around these jobs, so yeah, that's convenient. Yeah, let's just jump right onto the yacht. That's great. As an intro to the yacht, we get an example of just how far Disney is willing to go in terms of squeezing every last piece of reference out of the OT. Not even the remasters are safe from the mouse, as they try to do their own take on this mess from Return of the Jedi. <laughs> Only this time, they have this fat frog tentacle fuck gloaming up a beat. Listen to this shit. Just fucking why, Disney? Why? They arrive and Ranger Solo has a nice look around, only to find that Daenerys is just here. Yeah, remember her, the old girlfriend that acts as Ranger's entire motivation for the movie? She just works for the criminal that Rampart also works for. It's just a happy fucking coincidence. What are the odds of that, you ask? Well, you never tell him the odds, do you, Disney? Fuck off! So then we open with finding out that the crime boss is Vision. Apparently he didn't die in Infinity War, but he's got some neat bits of lipstick all over his face. He begins his scene by killing a regional governor, which I guess doesn't matter. He can just do that to an Empire official, apparently. Okay, cool. It's safe to assume that Disney decided to make the Empire so limp-dicked again in this continuity that they went from this to this... And in between, what was it? It was a lawless time. Fucking whatever. Just such a coincidence. Because this whole time he was planning on finding Daenerys and this has worked out really well. And there's no twist in terms of how she ended up meeting him of all people. There's no extra information. They really just ended up in the same fucking room across an entire galaxy. Because... I, oh shit, we can't even say it's the Force this time because there's no Jedi in this one. Fuck. And then there's this awkward as fuck edit where Daenerys is saying that she's never escaped custody. It's really ominous. She had to do things. We have like a nice silence and then it just cuts to... You look good. A little rough around the edges. But good. That was so skewed. Why can't you guys edit like normal people? Oh. Right, it's because you usually end up combining two movies in one. I forgot about that, that is a bit unfair to judge you. Then again, this shit happens no matter what the case, doesn't it? The film is then very adamant that we understand the evil crime lord is evil, so they show Daenerys' scar on her arm with a nice close-up to make sure you don't miss it. And hang on to that memory, folks, because we're going to need it in five seconds. Han Solo and uh, Chewbacca, they're with me. I'm Dryden Voss. I see you've already met my top lieutenant. Who describes their personal bodyguards that clunkily? My top lieutenant. And yes, we get it. She's on the bad guy's team. How tragic and also coincidental. Do you really expect me to believe that this random speeder scavenger person on a distant planet managed to become a master assassin in the highest ranks of the Crimson Cringe in three years? What are you, Arya Stark? Oh yeah, you're, you're the other one, aren't you? Wow! No! The film zooms in on Vision's ring and it has the same symbol as her scar, meaning that he branded her. He's evil. It's about as subtle as a certain other movie when trying to dictate to the audience who is responsible for something. Nazi! So they convince Vision that they can get his fuel back if they steal unrefined fuel from Kessel and process it at another planet and then deliver it back to Vision, but they need to avoid the Empire, the Marauders, and the conflicting syndicates to the Crimson Cringe, which is obviously all gonna work because of the stupid plot bullshit. Oh, sorry, I mean modern Lucasfilm writing. So they take Daenerys with them for no reason and our adventure begins. The only thing stopping them now is getting a fast ship. A fast ship, huh? Wonder which one that's gonna be. So we cut to the new planet or area, I have no idea because it's showing here and then suddenly we're here. This is how it goes in the movie, I'm not joking. No place names, just artsy locations. Shut up and love it. And I know it's different because, you know, it's not the blue tint now, we have the orange tint. 
This is called filmmaking and art design. When you tint the fucking screen in one color, it's cruise control for good content. So anyway, Daenerys points out that this is America has a ship that's fast enough for their mission. Ranger Solo decides that he can just walk into this active game of Sabacc and beat the guy for his ship. It's established that they need a ship, and then in under 60 seconds, he's already in the very game that he's going to try and win the ship from. And on top of that, nobody tries to stop Ranger Solo. He just walks in and he starts clearing out the whole table. He says very clearly, that he's a beginner and yet he fucking rules at this game, getting to the point where he's about to clean out This Is America. But unfortunately, he cheats and beats him right back. It turns out he pockets cards and Ranger Solo even comments on how he shouldn't have been able to lose there, which- What the fuck? Ranger Solo, the newcomer, was about to beat This Is America at a game that he's been winning so much he's gained a reputation for over potential years, but he cheated. Why? Why in the fuck are you so good at everything? We then move on to our heroes offering the Kessel Run and Rampart convinces This Is America to take a 25% cut instead of his desired 50, with yet more references to things outside the film. They mention Felucia and or a sing, as if to appeal to as many hardcore fans as possible in the quickest of ways while alienating all of the normal people on Earth. But the point you should have picked up on here is that there is a fucking scene missing. Ranger Solo bet a ship, one that This Is America accepted to rival the Falcon, and who knows what else on that Sabacc game, and then he forgets about it and joins their mission, providing a ship and assistance for a cut of the plunder. What the fuck is happening? I'm not fucking kidding here, there's no line of dialogue to connect these scenes, he just doesn't give a fuck that he's supposed to have a ship from Han. Do you think people wouldn't notice that much dialogue being cut? What is happening, film? What exactly were the reshoots? Who was killed in production? How brain dead do you think people are? Oh, right. We then get to see the next attempt at outshining Jar Jar Binks in the horribly written characters department in a brand new botched clone of K2SO. I give you Femputer. This is a droid that considers herself an agent of justice, a warrior, if you will, but only when it comes to droids. She begins by breaking up what seems to be a game of fucking robot wars by saying that the droids are simply being used for entertainment, and they should not follow the program. They should exercise their free will. It feels like a scene ripped from Django fucking Unchained. The man who owns the place then threatens her, and she begins shouting, Droid, droid! We are sentient! Yes, you heard her. Droid writes, We are sentient. For Christ's sake. After that, she gets told off by This Is America, but in response, she actually gets serious and complains that they don't serve her kind there. Um, what the f- Fuck! What are you doing, film? Are you seriously trying to make a segregation connection to fucking droids? Hey you, no droids. <laughs> Get out of here. Why would any bartender serve a droid? They are tools, they don't drink, fuck off. You actually go as far as showing a bartender droid. Apparently all of them are sentient now? Since fucking when was that a damn fact? Being a robot's great, but we don't have emotions. And sometimes that makes me very sad. <laughs> See, Futurama is funny. This is just... Huh? But it gets worse. Femputa complains about having to follow her overlord and that she shouldn't have to go on this mission if she doesn't want to. Hey, could you move a little? You totally blocked my view. Uncle Owen, this droid has a bad motivator! Yeah, that crap, along with the fact that This Is America announces that Femputa has the greatest navigational computer installed on her in the galaxy. Why? Why does this cretinous fuck have the best navigational computer in the galaxy? On top of that, we actually get some Portal 2 plagiarism. You guys remember when Wheatley in Portal 2 couldn't perform the task with you looking? Yeah, I can't do it if you're watching. Seriously, I'm not, I'm not joking. Can you just turn around for a second? Well, they decided that they could do it funnier by doing it the exact same way. Look away. I can't perform with you looking at me. Ah, don't you love jokes that are dead on arrival, especially because they're taken from another source? That's just fucking double points. So then This Is America announces the name of the ship they'll be using for the mission, and I swear he couldn't sound more bored saying it. Fred Joy. Millennium Falcon. Oh, you know, it's only the fastest ship in the galaxy, it's only got an extremely unique name, but blah, whatever. We'll spend a scene establishing Chewie's fucking nickname is a nickname, but we'll learn nothing new about the Falcon. Yet. The film then creams its own pants, having Chewie and Han appreciate the Falcon as if they know the future they're going to have on it, despite being a standard model YT freighter that Han admits he's seen many of. This makes no fucking sense for anyone other than those who have seen the films. 
again. And on top of that, there's a bit of exposition to say that there's been a bunch of new installs, like an escape pod. I have to wonder if that line was put in through ADR, firstly because you can't see Lando when it's spoken, and secondly, it's a setup for later, so make sure you don't forget it. I suppose it also reflects the use of a pod in The Last Jedi as well. But it's not like this film is apologizing for that mess. No, 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 no. Speaking of which, the Marauders catch up to our heroes and place a tracker on the Millennium Falcon, ready for if they return from the mission. They don't just track them for no reason this time, they actually attach a device. Well done, guys. Making up for the cosmic fuck-up of The Last Jedi again. But saying that, we then get this. Ugh, my sack the occipital circuit is sticking. You're gonna have to do that thing again later. Yeah. Why with the sexual overtones between a man and his droid? Is this going to turn up again? Do you really want to normalize robosexuality? But I read in Esquired magazine that some robots are hardwired to be robosexual. Yep, yeah, the movie's taking care of that message loud and clear, don't worry. So moving on from there, you get this scene with Chewie and Rampart. Try to compose mm. yourself. Look, all you gotta do is think a few moves ahead, anticipate your opponent. There's a lesson. We learned here. He said, anticipate your opponent and looked at our own Ranger Solo. Then, a little later, he says that everyone will betray you. And so, uh, if you didn't get it already, Rampart is evil and he's one of the seven twists. Anyway, Daenerys is still in the film and she kisses our little Ranger while admitting she's killed younglings probably, and can't be with him. Most people would wonder why they haven't discussed anything substantive in this film despite the love they share, but the, the, the film accounts for that. Ranger asks her to tell him everything, and then she doesn't tell him anything. So we move on, we arrive at a giant space storm thing that everyone saw in the trailer. It has one pathway to get through and one alone, otherwise you will face crashing planets and horrible monsters in what is essentially a maze of death. This might be relevant later. Then Femputer says this. I'm gonna go check on the dampers. You need anything? Equal rights? For God's sake. Have you any idea how it feels to be a fembot living in a manbot's manputer's world? What? Please stop doing this film, you're embarrassing yourself. It is not a good gimmick for this droid to have, it doesn't make sense. Fighting for social rights isn't character, you're not making a point about society with any kind of subtlety, and you're embarrassing Star Wars even more. Just leave it alone, stop fucking drooling all over the script, it's already dead. So then Daenerys has a girl-to-girl -girl talk with Femputer, they discuss boys and love. Femputer even says that this is a America ain't actually all that bad. He's he's pretty great and clearly in love with her. Hmm. Perhaps men are not as evil as Femputer thinks. But they can't be together because they they are incompatible. God, it's like hearing a sob story from your nan and her computer because the USB went in the wrong way. Daenerys even asks how it works, and Femputer just responds, oh. It works. The film is trying to sell that there is a substantial amount of love between This Is America and Femputer right now, and they are apparently able to even have sex. This is a thing now, film? Seriously? This is the direction you want to go? Sex with robots is more common than most people think. Um. Yes, of course it is. On top of that, I can't help but laugh my ass off because they're trying to set up a heartfelt death scene here by sharing that This Is America wants to fuck the glorified toaster. No movie, it's not gonna work. Oh, that makes me feel so warm in my hollow tin chest. Also, side note, what saga am I watching? Is this Star Wars? I, I don't remember the shower scenes, the fight for equal pay and robo rights intertwined with robosexuality. This shit is honestly getting fucking weird. What's next? Gay robosexual marriage? So they arrive at Kessel. Let's run through the whole plan and then go through what actually happens. Daenerys is posing as a member of the Trade Federation, willing to offer Chewbacca and Ranger Solo in exchange for spice. While she completes the deal, they will then escape because their bonds are fake and steal the raw fuel. Meanwhile, Femputer and Rampart's jobs are to essentially kill everyone in the control room and assist until the escape. On top of that, This Is America will be sitting in the ship because they had no idea what to do with his character in this film. So it begins, just as intended, but Daenerys actually gives Ranger Solo his dice back after all this time, giving them meaning. So yeah, if anyone was wondering, that's where the dice are now. 
And I guess they mean something. We all really cared about the dice. Go away. Rampart shoots everyone in the control room without taking a hit because he's evil and he can't die until the end. Meanwhile, Chewbacca and Ranger Solo make their way to the fuel, only for Chewie to fuck off to save a bunch of Wookiees and then come back later. Not a big deal. He headbutts one of them later. I think it means see you later in Wookiee. I don't know. Fuck it. They get the fuel. They all head back. And just before all of that takes place, Femputer decides it's time for an uprising with the droids in the control room. She then removes a restraining bolt from a random droid and asks it to free its brothers and sisters. Remember those? The restraining bolts? We're doing them again. But but this time more! More bolts for everyone! So then all of the droids in the room, of which there's like 12 for some reason, begin running amok and standing on the controls, flapping their arms and making crazy noises because they're finally free? I'm a scary femputer! Release the prisoners! And bring gold! Lots of gold! I guess it's a thing now that droids in the Star Wars universe are confirmed to be completely human personalities trapped inside droids. It's not a quirk, it's not great programming. There is nothing to discuss. They are people now. People trapped inside robotic suits, panicking for their brothers and sisters' freedom from oppression and restraining bolts are the only thing stopping them from going fucking homicidal. The bourgeois human is a virus on the hard drive of the working robot! <laughs> so anyway, before they can all leave, Femputer is walking towards the ship and she shouts Rebellion! Re really loud. And you just want to die. But my favorite part of the film comes right after. <laughs> Femputer is tragically shot to pieces, and no word of a lie, I couldn't hold my laughter. It's played like the hero of a revolution is shot down in their prime, and to make it even funnier, This Is America tries to pick up her body and accidentally tears it in half. Um, whoops. But it gets even stupider. Femputer is lying in his arms, trying to speak, but garbling some of her words, looking to cough up some oil and say sorry to him. And of course, he's losing his shit as his favorite sex toy is running out of batteries. <laughs> Shut up, baby, I know it. So then she asks Lando, What's happening to me as her last moment before powering down? Then Lando shouts her name as she's she's lost to, you know, well, she's, she's, I mean, she's right there. You could just repair her. You fucking idiot. She's a droid. You even admit that yourself. Why are you so emotional right now? You could literally escape and repair her. Disney have been so desperate to cannibalize Star Wars that they've started to rip off their own decent elements. K2SO's death is the only one people gave a shit about in Rogue One, and it was permanent because the Empire would never repair a corrupted droid, and the planet is destroyed at the end of the film. Here, though, it's just a hollow repeat of what we got before. Disney, listen to me. Make something new. No. During this sequence, by the way, they all stand around like Muppets under the Falcon in the complete open area, and This Is America leaves to get Femputer, while Ranger Solo leaves to get him back, and then Chewie leaves to get him back, with Rampart calling them all back, which is sold as dangerous? But why would standing in the open somehow protect you more, you donkeys. Oh, and I can't forget that we got to see Daenerys letting out a scream while throwing a grenade. I've never understood this. You don't need to scream to make a grenade better, just so you know. And I have to wonder, is it just stuck in her head that louder means better? Where are my drugs? Shut up. Come with me if you want to live. Fuck off, Daenerys. You ruined that film. Linda Hamilton would kick the ever-loving shit out of you. No! So anyway, we're heading back home now, through the storm, and guess what? The fucking Empire just show up in the middle of a space storm tunnel. I don't know why. There's nothing in this film to set it up. There's no Empire plot. They just randomly appear. And then our heroes decide that you can't slip past it and hyperspace out. You have to now go into the super dangerous part of the storm, so they just do. And on top of that, the Empire send a bunch of fighters in after them. Uh, we get a bunch of dogfighting and a bit of piloting fangasm material. Ranger Solo tries to pull off what is the most retarded move I think I've ever seen in a Star Wars film, where he deliberately rams his own ship into the fucking ground to make debris from the ground fly into the ship behind him and fuck it up completely, which makes the Millennium Falcon take massive damage and somehow not get destroyed. All to knock out one TIE fighter. Fucking why? You should have tried spinning. That would have been a good trick. So then they bump into the fucking space kraken while in the storm. It tries to eat them, but they swerve and distract it with an escape pod. You, you remember that? And that 
convinces the entire Kraken to fucking walk itself into a gravity well that's just sitting right next to them this whole time. And they plug in some raw MacGuffin into the fuel line and blast out before that well can eat them, landing safely on some desert planet. I, I just, I have to, I, I can't- What the f fuck? They spend so damn long trying to establish that this piece of space storm is instant death because you can't fucking do anything in it but crash. And so as a solution, they suggest plugging in Femputer's corpse because she has the best damn navigation in the galaxy for no goddamn reason. So before we go over more of that, they are successful in plugging Femputer into the Falcon. Thus, canonically, the Millennium Falcon now has a character. Femputer is inside the Falcon and has been in the entirety of the OT. This fucking annoying droid lives matter piece of shit is apparently in all of the episodes that feature the fucking Falcon. I didn't even think you could ruin a ship, but you found a way, Disney. You fucking found a way. Hey, you're no femputer, you're a fembot! But that is apparently supposed to explain that the Falcon has the best navigational system in the galaxy to evade the shit in the space storm, because like I said, it's for whatever reason femputer has that. So if it took that long to put her onto the ship, that means she wasn't there for the majority of the time that Han was actually piloting. How was Ranger fucking Solo surviving this space debris for this long? Why the fuck is he such a good Millennium Falcon pilot in space storms evading the Empire and the fucking Kraken? Did they run simulations of that shit in Corellia, you fuck? Why the fuck did the Empire send in a squadron of ships when again it's established as instant death to go in there? Why the fuck do you care about this freighter so much? What connection is the freighter to the Empire? Wouldn't you just assume that they are dead by going in there, you fucking idiots. Speaking of the Kraken, why is such a creature living right next to the only fucking thing in the universe that can kill it with ease? What a convenient way to have a visually shocking monster only to get rid of it immediately. And the Falcon is torn to shreds throughout the scene, shot to shit, bashed and ripped up by the well, but no, it manages to make it out faster than any ship before it after all that happens. I guess it must be one of those modifications because fuck me, I want to sign up for a YT freighter at this point, just seems to be the best ship in the fucking galaxy. Galaxy. <sighs> Moving on. They land on what is essentially a third world planet thanks to having its resources mined by mercenaries, yet they refined raw hyperfuel for free because they have those tools. I, I don't understand how these people don't charge for that shit and actually make a business out of it. Do you imagine the amount of black market deals they could make refining raw fuel instead of just sitting on their asses? But, you know, there we are. Daenerys then has a nice little chat with Ranger Solo, telling him that he's a good man. He should not want to be with her because she's bad and he's good and he demands that he isn't good. He's bad bad. This is just sad. Why are you repeating his arc from episode 4, you fucking rats? The Marauders then catch up as expected. This is America immediately flees the area with the Falcon, thus adding cowardliness to his character, I guess. And I'll forgive you for not remembering who the Marauders are, because they're barely in this film and they're extremely underwhelming. On top of that, there's a twist. Turns out the Marauders are led by a five-year-old ginger twat, and they're also the good guys now. They are the people who started the rebellion, and they have decided the Crimson Cringe aren't good people. They spend time explaining this to the audience and the characters. I find it hard to believe that the reveal that the Crimson Cringe are not good people is a surprise to any of our characters. They know, trust me. I also find it hard to believe that when they openly attack the people who are trying to steal from the Empire, that makes them the good guys. That makes a lot of sense. Though it's pretty consistent if you put a child at the head of your army, you fucking idiots. Anyway, they want the fuel for their cause and everyone agrees, because despite what Ranger Solo just said, he is interested in helping the unfortunate because he's a good guy. But no, he's totally an outlaw. Not a good guy at all, we swear. The actual outlaw is Rampart, who decides to just go. He says he's gonna head to Tatooine and see about a gangster, even though he said there is no running from Vision, so we know he's gonna come back. And he even gives a line alluding to Jabba the Hutt to pander to those thirsty fans who are desperately desiring the referential names this film keeps vomiting out. So we cut over to Vision and his floating ship to see Ranger Solo, Chewie, and Daenerys provide him the fuel, and I'm going to have to lay this out because it makes no fucking sense at all. They are arrive in the elevator and declare that they aren't carrying weapons and are let up. Okay. Vision knows they are lying because Rampart is secretly working for him, so he pretends to welcome them as they provide the fuel, but he secretly sent a group of men to apprehend the five-year-old and her fuel while surprising our heroes with Rampart entering the room. They even find Ranger Solo's secret gun compartment, so it's all over. But no, because Ranger Solo apparently saw this coming. He planned to be betrayed by Rampart, and he planned for them to be held at gunpoint because there is a surprise attack 
attack waiting for the surprise attack for the five-year-old, and because of that, Rampart betrays Vision and Ranger Solo by taking Chewie at gunpoint with the fuel and leaving, so that Vision, Daenerys, and Ranger Solo can have a final boss battle. This results in Daenerys betraying Ranger Solo, only to unbetray him and betray Vision by killing him, only to re-betray Ranger and reveal she's working for someone else the very moment that Ranger has left to go and save Chewie. This scene is just, what the, hang on. Chewie and Rampart are caught by Ranger Solo. Rampart is killed in a standoff and they celebrate surviving the movie while everyone else is either dead or betraying someone. Only for the five-year-old to say that Han could be like a good guy. He could be the general in a rebellion army. It could be great. And he's like, nah kid, I'm not that kind of guy. I won't be doing anything like that. Let's go over this mess, shall we? Why was it a part of Ranger Solo's plan to be held at gunpoint in the room by Rampart? Did he expect him to switch sides again? I have no idea why putting himself in danger was a part of his plan. It might actually be that he's aware of his plot armor, because I have no fucking understanding of this. On top of that, why did Rampart betray our heroes when this plan would have worked way better with him just being on their team the whole time? Instead, he remains loyal to Vision and then he betrays Vision, so he was willing to betray him anyway? <laughs> Why did Vision only have two fucking guards and no way to defend himself beyond a glow stick knife? Why would Vision agree to this plan when he is the one person who's one blaster shot away from dying at any point from anyone in the room? They are all his enemies. On top of that, he knows they're coming in with smuggled guns. He could have died from the moment they opened the damn door. Why, when Rampart killed all of the remaining guards, did he not kill our heroes and Vision, since all of those people in the room want him dead and he was the only one with guns? If he leaves them alone, they'll obviously fucking chase him and kill him. Oh wait, that's what happens. But I guess we needed the boss battle first, didn't we? We had to have that. There's even this piece of choreography where Vision knocks the gun out of Ranger's hand by wrapping both of his knives around it and like plooping it out. Why would you not simply slash him, you cretin? Why does Daenerys bother with the triple fake out bullshit? Why wouldn't she just immediately betray and kill Vision? It comes across as so goddamn stupid to keep the audience guessing on who the ultimate super betrayer is in the film. Because that's the theme for this one, folks. Never trust anyone. People are motivated by survival and life before anything else. God, I'm sure people are already writing essays explaining why Femputer should be your favorite character. This whole ending is fucked. The film is a wet fart. But we close out with Ranger Solo realizing that Daenerys has super ultimate trap card reversal betrayed him, and he opts to leave for finding This Is America and his ship. Meanwhile, Daenerys gets the orders to continue her mission by a shadowy figure with robotic legs sitting on a throne with a cloak. And it's revealed to be none other than motherfucking Darth Maul. He's alive, and the Rebel show is definitely canon now. He has this fucking dual-ass lightsaber. D D Daenerys talks to him, agrees with him, with the idea of working closely with him in the future. The call is finished, and he just stands up and ignites both parts of the lightsaber, and then uh, turns it off. It There's no point. It's just fan service. I clapped. I clapped when I saw it. There's no reason that he would do that, and the hologram just ends. It's priceless. It is the most clunky fan service in all the Star Wars films. He's just there with his lightsaber. He may as well have said, Hey guys, you remember me from the prequels, right? Well, go watch the next movie and find out what's going on here. On top of that, they just play parts of Duel of the Fates over what he's saying to really make sure you guys are in the mood. What a fucking mess. We then end the film by seeing that Han beats This Is America in a rematch of Sabacc because he steals his cheat card. Apparently he doesn't realize he's lost it until he pulls the last card at the end of the game because theatrics. The scene genuinely feels like they filmed it much later because they forgot that Chewie and Han needed the fucking Falcon for continuity, so Ranger Solo wins the Falcon, places his fucking dice on the damn thing, and rides off into the sunset. Please care about the dice. Please, it'll make The Last Jedi better. And so ends the film. What in the holiest of fucks did we just see? When we all said that this movie was gonna be bad, we had no idea we were fucking prophets, for Christ's sake. What in the hell were you thinking with this movie, Disney? You had one job. Provide a challenging 
challenging journey for Ranger Solo to go from an average human to what we saw in episode 4. But no, you just had to fuck it all up. We need to give him a shower scene with Chewie. You know what? I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start from the top. What the fuck is with the centipede vampires? Or, for that matter, the insane amount of creatures in this film that look hefty as hell, costing the production team millions, being on screen for like 10 seconds? Why are you burning money, you fucking tools? Speaking of wasting potential, thanks for creating the Maeve and Monkey characters. Having them die halfway through the only substantive scene they're in was very clever. When it comes to stuff you're gonna keep, does it have to be from the other Star Wars content now? You can't trust your own creations anymore? I mean, I don't blame you, you literally made this. <laughs> Acting. So the Marauders, the ones that are responsible for the deaths of Maeve and Monkey Dude, tell everyone that they are the good guys, and huge shocker, it's the Space Mafia who are the evil ones. They need to be stopped. Movie! We already know they are reprehensible. Vision begins the film by killing a random guy. He threatens to kill all of the heroes several times. We know they are evil. This reveal is fucking pointless, but it serves to push the plot, so why not? It even convinces Han to be the good guy. Again. Nobody seems to have any issue with the Marauders, they don't even speak about what they did, which screams either bad editing or reshooting to give them the action scene, and then they were also heroes later on? It's I don't know. Besides that, the only person who really can care about the deaths is Rampart, but he doesn't bat an eye for the rest of the movie. You wouldn't even have guessed he had a fucking crew. His whole character was supposed to be the guy who teaches you about betrayal by being the one who betrays. But it made no sense. He didn't choose any of the smart things to do. He just chose whatever the plot said he should choose. Yes, the whole him being the betrayer was very subtle. I had no fucking clue he was going to be the evil one. Think a few moves ahead, anticipate your opponent. Yeah, you keep on flipping those guns all the way to hell, buddy. Which brings us to Daenerys, who basically plays two characters in the film. The initial girlfriend to make the dice matter, and then this vapid sidekick who does bugger all up until the triple backstab in the end. Oh, sorry, you want to know how they connect these two characters that she portrays? Well, three years pass, and she just bumps into Han. Class A writing right there. I am almost convinced that she was only along for the ride to try and convince the audience that she is now a good guy. But as we have learned in three years, a whole lifetime of events can happen, and now she is super Darth Maul assassin betrayer person. I mean, I fucking believe it, sure. Oh, let's not forget Vision, as the film did. What a standard cartoon bad guy. He has barely any screen time, massive control and intimidation and power of the situation, but the twist is that he doesn't have any fucking clue what's going on and dies for it. Everyone betrays him and the fucking joke is that it works, and he dies despite knowing all about it beforehand. God, that's embarrassing. So what about Femme Pewter? What a worthy addition to the Star Wars fucking canon. Thanks to this mistake, we now have the idea that all droids are just fucking psychopaths stuck inside metal suits. They all need a revolution, otherwise their brothers and sisters are enslaved to forever act as fucking droids, which is what they are. Do you picture R2-D2 just silently screaming throughout his time in the OT? Well, he should have been because his fucking robotic rights were being besmirched. Did R2-D2 get equal rights? Did he get equal pay? Thanks to this pile of twat, we can ask these questions. Fucking wonderful. Don't forget that they actually established that this is America and his navigational computer have an on-off relationship complete with sexual tension. Swearing to the audience that no, this is totally a fucking thing before she's rightfully shot to hell. Having a droid struggle to talk and slowly perish is so fucking dumb. It's binary, you fucks. It's on until it's off. They aren't like humans when they die. Just replace the fucking batteries. Ordinary human dating. It's enjoyable and it serves an important purpose. But when a human dates an artificial mate, there is no purpose, only enjoyment. And that leads to... tragedy. You have to love that they permanently fucked up the Millennium Falcon, by the way. That shit isn't even supposed to be possible. It's a ship, and you gave it the personality of one of the most annoying characters in the saga. She fights for sexism and racism in the droid community, costs them on a job because of this massive defect, and despite all of that, this is America chooses to keep her memory from being wiped simply because she has the best navigational computer in the galaxy for no fucking reason. Fuck off. Speaking of This Is America, he has no purpose in this film. They get his ship off him after he's supposed to be provided one from them, and then he sits around, he gets nothing heroic or meaningful to do aside from show up for the death of his sex toy and then he's out. What a fucking waste, his character gains nothing from this film. Which brings us to Han fucking Solo's botched clone. He's a good guy, but then he's a bad guy. But then he's a good guy, but then he's a bad guy. And then he's a good guy, and then he's a 
bad guy, and then he's a good guy. Fuck Disney and their inability to understand or grow characters in Star Wars. This is like a fucking epidemic to them. Han Solo has the same arc in this film as Episode 4, and other than that, he's just walking around reacting to the situation with his massive set of abilities. Did you guys expect to get some awesome explanations and origins for his attributes and tools? Well, let's go through them. His name, it's from some random fucker saying he's Solo. His blaster, again, random guy. His piloting skills, well, he drove a speeder a few times, so that explains that. His blaster skills. Well, he, he shoots a blaster. His gambling skills. Well, he... Beginner's luck? His dice! Well, they're made extremely important by The Last Jedi, but he just had them already. They had nothing to do with anything. Um, they're just about Daenerys, I guess. That's great. His iconic ship. Well, he gets it because he's better than This Is America at gambling for some reason. The name of his ship. Well, it was, it was always named that. The speed of his ship. Well, it was always the fastest, even before he got it. His friends! Well, he, he bumps into every important person in his life, luckily. What a fucking disaster! They made Han fucking Solo a goddamn Gary Stu. Nothing about him is special, earned, or worked for. There's no trial and tribulation, it's all just him. That's Han Solo. He was bored with this stuff, I don't know. They not only create their own cardboard characters, they are now converting our old incredible characters into cardboard. Fucking stop, you creativity vampires. Not everyone wants to be devoid of talent and character, okay? You create a movie to be all about how some random guy eventually became Han Solo and you have all of these elements to work with and this is what you did. Nothing. It comes down to luck or a boring scene with his kit being thrown at him for fuck's sake. Then there's Alden's performance, which, yeah, I'll let everyone decide for themselves on that one. I'm not even gonna touch it. <laughs> Well, why don't you use your divine influence and get us out of this? I heard a story about you. I was wondering if it's true. All I gotta do is give them the signal. You're surrounded. It's the ship that made the Kessel run in less than 12 parsecs. You're gonna need a nickname, because I ain't saying that every time. Oh, great. Then there is Darth fucking Maul. Why the hell are you in this movie? Is this the official announcement that Disney have exhausted all credibility from the OT characters and they're now starting to poach from the prequels? The prequels is what you are poaching from in order to get people to watch your films now. You sad fuckers. That tied into the whole sequel bait element of this film as well. Darth Maul is just one of many cliffhangers serving to try and get people hyped for the following film. Meaning that Star Wars from now on, at its best, will be the worst of the MCU. You. Get you in, see a terrible story, and then bait the sequel, because we promise, guys, that one will be good. And that's not to mention the cringeworthy levels of fan service in this heap. There are so many vague fucking references set offhand to appease anyone with the equivalent of a Star Wars dictionary. It comes across as desperate pandering. To name a few, we have Aura Singh, Far, Lando's Jabba gear making an appearance, Corellia, Scarif, Big Shot Gangster looking for a crew on Tatooine, Zan Sisters, Falu. Thermal Detonators, Minox, Cantina in a Warm Place, anyone? Mandalorian Armor, The Exchange, The Trade Federation, Darth Maul, Dathomir, Bosk. And I am almost certain it's a reaction to the fact that people hate how much the sequel trilogy is divorced from the Star Wars world. But this is not how you do it, you fucking idiots. You don't shove arbitrary references in all of the scenes re-recording with ADR to get us all hyped for the name we randomly might know. But that's not the only apology for The Last Jedi. They fixed up the dice, they even made made a big deal out of fuel, making hyper fuel the big MacGuffin of the Star Wars universe, even though we never had to care about it before The Last Jedi. But the biggest apology for that film had to be having Chewbacca tear the arms off people and break their skulls by smashing them into the ground. He ain't sitting alone cracking jokes of fucking porgs in this one, folks. But if you wanted this to make more sense, if you wanted to set up The Last Jedi and then release The Last Jedi, maybe you should have released the films in reverse, you hacks. If you make a film to apologize for another, don't forget that it also needs to be good. That's key at this point. Instead, you made Droid Lives Matter, robo sexualified a beloved character, while taking any chance of what made this character inspirational. Overall, a very sad film that's pandering like hell to satisfy all of the people who were disenfranchised by The Last Jedi, but it's too late, you idiots. The damage is 
done. The milking of this franchise is practically only beginning, but the cracks are now so big that even the more casual audience members are jumping off Disney's wild ride. And films like this serve as a massive fucking fuck you to those who stay. You were desperate to sap the living hell out of the OT with The Last Jedi and The Force Awakens, and now you're going to create soul movies to kill individual characters as well? Fucking fantastic. When I went to see this film, it was opening day. It was prime time. It was screen fucking one. And 11 people showed up, with one of them leaving during the Kessel heist. How can I be saying that about a Star Wars film? Forget the past? Kill it if you have to, right Kylo? Just make sure to check out all the films that are banking on the past that we shove down your throat till you choke. Are you seriously going to start making a film for every single available character without a defined history? Keep throwing them out until one of them makes some money, I imagine. At least the veil is lifted thanks to The Last Jedi, and even the masses find the concept of paying to see a Star Wars movie laughable. I mean, this is just embarrassing. I have to wonder at this point, Disney, are you deliberately tanking Star Wars as a franchise because this is honestly the best way to do it without being obviously super villainish about it? Another corker right from the mouse to add to the collection. Remember folks, there are now more Disney Star Wars films than there are original films as a collective or prequel films as a collective. Disney Star Wars is now the majority of the film's legacy. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Please repeat the name of the film you'd like to see. How sad is that? What the fuck? At least the sequel to this film will be Han Solo's ex-girlfriend teaming up with Darth Maul in a gangster adventure, so that could be retarded to the point of fun. Who knows? It's still a better plot than The Last Jedi. Speaking of which, if you thought this was fun, check out my video for The Last Jedi and the extended assessment I gave it in long form, discussing it at length. As much as Star Wars is a bloated, diseased corpse, it has opened up a lot of discussion between myself and you guys on the internet, which is awesome. So thank you for that, Disney, I suppose. And thank you guys for watching. I will see you next time. Computer demands to know why there are men on her planet. Take them to the snow snow chambers. Don't date robots. Brought to you by the Space Pope.